Good morning to everyone. Good to see you having good fellowship. And I'm going to invite you to take your seat. I don't want to interrupt good fellowship, but it's time for the, the word of the Lord. And it's wonderful to see you here in Delta Church this morning. Those who are on live stream, welcome to you. And it's great to worship great to worship, and I trust we continue that worship experience at this time. We've already read Jonah chapter 1, and if you could open your Bible or your phone, uh, keep your finger on the text with me and follow along. I think it'll take more meaning if that happens, and we want to have an experience with the Word of God this morning. So, Jonah chapter 1, we've already read, and let's pray about Jonah's journey this morning. It's a fascinating journey, a journey that I think speaks to all of us today in Delta at this very day. So Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you were faithful to Jonah, and likewise you're faithful to us because you are the God who never changes. In Jesus' name, we ask your blessing on our next few minutes. In his name, amen. Well, I begin with a question this morning, and a question that I'm, I'm going to ask you to answer yourself. You don't have to get up and speak and answer it, but to yourself, please answer it. And that is, how long has it been since you've prayed about the will of God? How long has it been since you have prayed about the will of God? In Christian teaching, there is significant emphasis on the will of God, particularly for young people, for young adults and teenagers. Pray about who you're going to marry. Pray about where you're going to school. Pray, pray about what vocation you are going to enter into. But the question is, how important is the will of God to those of us who are adults this morning at Delta Pentecostal Church? Do we as adults actively seek the will of God or divine direction? Do we say to the Lord, Lord, I am open to be led by you. I want to know your voice. I want to be actively directed by your spirit. That's the question this morning, and that's the question that came to this man, Jonah, who was an adult in this story. Well, what are some possible areas of divine direction? Well, for those of you who are, who are married, there can become praying for the Lord's will, for wisdom, for a healthy marriage relationship. I believe the Lord wants to direct our marriages, but in every marriage there are times of tension or disagreement. If somebody comes up to me and says, we haven't had a time, one instance of, of tension or disagreement in the last 30 years, um, I'd kind of question your integrity <laughs> at that point, pardon me, because every marriage I know has times of tension or disagreement. There are times when we need to apologize to our spouse concerning at least hurt feelings and maybe more. There are times in which I have received direction from the Lord, I believe, that I should apologize to Catherine. Is that true, Catherine? Yes, indeed, that I have been directed to apologize. So we need to pray about direction in terms of our marriage. We need to pray about wisdom in raising our children and wisdom in terms of interacting with our grandchildren if we are grandparents active sense of the Lord's will, direction that he can give us in these very practical areas of life. I'm going to tell you a story about direction I believe the Lord gave me in terms of our children. I've alluded to it before, but I'm going to go into a little more detail this morning on it. We were living in Abbotsford when our, our daughter Jennifer graduated from high school, and we wanted our daughters to go to university. We wanted them to get a good education and a good career, but first suggested that they take one year of Bible college. 
it, I believe, is something that was wonderfully significant in their lives. Well, the assumption was, since Dad was president of Summit Pacific College, that both of them would go for their one-year Omega Challenge to Summit Pacific College. But the challenge was that Jen, our elder daughter, had her heart go to go to Cape and Ray Bible College in Australia about as far away as you can get from Canada. Now, you have to recognize the personality of our two daughters. Our first daughter, Jennifer, who dearly loved us, very much wanted to be an individual. She didn't want to be in Dad's shadow. And Dad was president of the Bible College. She didn't want to ride on Dad's name. She wanted to be an individual with her own worth and her own significance. Well, we were working this through, and Jamie, our second daughter, is, was exactly the opposite. She was happy to ride on dad and mom's name. She was happy to be known as a Richards. Two different children from the same parents. Anyway, we were working this through in our lives, and the assumption was that Jen would go to Summit Pacific College. And Catherine said to me, Jim, you should pray about this. I did. I prayed about the will of God in this area and what I should say to Jen. Well, amazingly enough, the Lord, in fact, revealed to me that he had other places for Jen to go to than Summit Pacific. And I said to Jen, and I do remember this night well, it was 10 o'clock, and I said to Jen, Jen, come and talk to me. I, I need to talk to you about something. And I was sitting in our bedroom in a big red velvet chair that so we have discarded that chair, haven't we, Catherine, and no longer even have it. And Jen came in and sat down, and I said to her, Jen, I believe it's the Lord's will for me to release you to go to Cape and Ray. And the tears welled up in her eyes, and she cried, and she said, thank you, Dad. You see, she was willing to go to Summit because didn't want to hurt Dad, but Dad had to hear God's voice in directing her, and she had a great year in Australia. Well, what about praying for the Lord's directing in terms of major purchases? The Lord's concerned about our money. The Lord's concerned about where we spend it. Now, I'm not talking about buying a tube of toothpaste at Walmart, okay? I don't agonize over that at all. But praying about major purchases like cars and houses and condos, and in terms of purchasing houses or rental units, let me put this seed thought in your mind. It's important where you live as to where you worship. And not enough people think about that. If the Lord has called you to Delta Pentecostal Church, then the assumption is that he'll provide housing within the radius somewhere of this church. What about praying for job or career changes? You see, the size of the salary isn't the only criteria for the child of God. Also involved in it, and God knows we need a salary. I'm not trying to decry that or minimize that. But the Lord wants you to be salt and light in your place of work, so where you work is of interest to him. What about how much we give to the Lord's work, okay? How much we are involved in committing financially to his church. Do we follow what I believe is the scriptural direction to give 10% of our income to the Lord's work? Wow. Some people think that is a huge, huge amount. Well, I could preach a whole sermon on this, but I won't do it, but I'm going to summarize it in about two minutes. I believe that tithing, giving 10% of our income right off the top, okay, right off the top is the Lord's will for our giving. Now, why do I believe that? You come to me and you say, Jim, that's an Old Testament edict. We live in the New Testament and we live under freedom. Well, the point is this. The Jewish people were directed to give 10%, and there's no redirection in the New Testament about giving, so I believe that it carries over from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But here's the key to why I give 10%. The Jewish people gave 
We live in the New Testament era, and look at the advantages that we have as New Testament believers. Number one, we have the full Scripture, New Testament and Old Testament. Old Testament people didn't have that. We know the fullness of the Spirit in the New Testament era. Only the prophets and kings and priests knew the fullness of the Spirit in the Old Testament. We know Jesus in the New Testament era in which we are in. So the conclusion I come to forgiving is this. With all of the advantages we have in the New Testament era, should I give less than the 10%? Something to ponder in terms of the Lord's will. It's important to affirm that the Lord wants to direct us. It's important to realize that the Lord wants to direct us. He's not too busy. Yes, the Lord is busy dealing with immigrants from around the world who are forced out of their countries and are in desperate situations. The Lord is concerned about dealing with people with heart attacks and cancer. But the point that is so important this morning is that he, he indeed is not too busy to direct us. And further, he doesn't turn his direction into a cosmic game of hide and seek. There are so many Christians who believe that, that God is hiding and we're trying to find him and we might find him and we might find his will, but maybe we won't. There's this cosmic game of hide and seek going on. That is absolutely contrary to Scripture. One of my favorite verses along this line is Isaiah chapter 58, verse 11. And you can see it on the screen behind me. It says, first of all, the Lord will guide you. There is a certainty of divine direction, this verse says. That is beautiful. That is wonderful. The Lord will guide you. The Lord will guide you always. Secondly, there is a consistency of divine direction. And further, it says, he will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. There will be a quality of divine direction that is amazing. He will direct you in a sun-scorched land, in an area in which there's great difficulties, trials and tribulations. He will direct you in an absolutely positive way. And this verse shows me that we are never shortchanged by seeking and particularly doing the Lord's will. Colossians 4 and 12 says this, stand firm in all the will of God. I love that. Stand firm in all the will of God. It's a constant trust in his will. And this is a challenge to do it. Someone has said this, trusting the Lord in his will is based on the belief that God's will is what we would do if we had all the facts. I like that. God's will is what we would do if we had all the facts. And the point is we don't have all the facts. We don't know what is good for us three years down the line. We have an idea of what is good for us, but we can't say, I certainly know what is good for me. And the wonderful truth is that God's will is what we would do if we had all the facts, because he has all the facts. And so the, the concept of seeking the Lord's will as an adult becomes tremendously important for all of us. In studying the book of Jonah, Helpful to get some, some background information this morning. First of all, Jonah is a historical figure. He is not a grand myth or a fairy tale. There are many people today that would say, oh, the Jonah story, well, that's a myth, so you don't have to really take it seriously. No, he was a real historical figure. And that's important. 2 Kings 14.25 says that Jonah prophesied to King Jeroboam II. Jer Jonah probably lived around 750 B.C. And what is really significant in this idea of Jonah being a historical figure is that Jesus believed he was a historical figure. And if we follow Jesus, we look at what he believed. And Jesus taught that as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, Jesus himself would be three days in the grave. Jesus believed this guy was a real significant figure. So the realization of him being historical adds to the significance of this miracle. This is a real person, 
and a real miracle that actually took place in history. Secondly, in terms of background, we see that the Lord directs Jonah to a very challenging place, and it was called Nineveh. This is in modern-day northern Iraq, and in Jonah's day, Nineveh was the capital of the great Assyrian Empire. Now, let me give you the background. This, this was no hick town. It was no place that was, you know, in the, in the far bush somewhere forgotten. This was the New York City of its day. It was the Paris or the London of its day. Major metropolitan area. It took three days to walk around the circumference of Nineveh. That's how big it was. More importantly, Nineveh is the constant enemy of Israel. The Ninevites also were a cruel and heartless people. They just weren't the enemies of Israel. They pummeled their enemies, including the Jews. They, in fact, buried alive their enemies after skinning them and impaling them on sharp poles. I'm sorry to describe graphically the cruelty of these people, but that is who they are. Now, you might say, what is that funny picture? Uh, that you have up there. I'm sorry, the photographer was Jim Richards who took this, and you know he didn't major in photography in seminary. But I'll, I'll tell you where this came from. Uh, just before COVID started, just over two years ago, I was teaching it at Continental Theological Seminary in Brussels, okay? And one Saturday, the faculty went on a magnificent excursion. We went in the Eurostar train and went under the English Channel, the channel, and came in two and a half hours from Brussels to London. And from there, we wandered around one of the great institutions in the world, the British Museum, one of the four top in the world. We can talk about what the others are after the service. But they have a stone relief of the Assyrian empire there, showing exactly what I'm talking about. And although you can't see it too well, there's a picture of people being impaled. Do you see the two pictures here, them being horizontal, and this is how they treated their enemies. These were not nice guys. And the Lord was directing Jonah to minister to them. These would be comparable to modern day ISIS. So instead of heading to Nineveh, jo Jonah heads to Joppa, which is the exact opposite direction of Nineveh. Joppa is the chief seaport of Israel. Jonah is ultimately heading for Tarshish, which is probably in southern Spain, making it about as far as he could get in his world from Nineveh. He finds a sailing ship in, 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 in Joppa, pays his fare, and descends into the hold of the ship where he tries to tune out the Lord's direction by falling asleep. Lord, forget your will. I'm not interested in it. A vicious storm, as we have read, comes up on the Mediterranean, and, well, Jonah loses his desire to pray it's fascinating that the pagan sailors begin praying, and they are fervently praying. Uh, Jonah wants to escape the voice of God, and the, and the sailors actually hear the voice of God. The sailors draw lots to see who's responsible for the storm. The lot falls on Jonah, that he is responsible for the storm. And if he is thrown overboard, the storm will stop, is what these pagan sailors hear from God. The sailors reluctantly show, throw Jonah overboard, and the sea immediately calms down. Now, Jonah chapter 2-1 is a verse that we didn't read, but I want us to look at that in our Bible because it is a wonderfully encouraging verse, an amazingly encouraging verse. Let's look at it now. It says this, Jonah 2-1, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Now, what's the big deal, Jim, about that verse? What the big deal is this. This verse affirms to me that I can pray anywhere, at any time, from any place, and be absolutely assured that God hears my prayer. There's no more obscure place to pray 
than in the stomach of a great fish. There's no place that physically would seem to be further from the Lord. He's not in the temple in Jerusalem. He's not with a group of believers in a prayer meeting. He's not in church. He's not worshiping. He is in the stomach of a fish, and it's a beautiful, encouraging verse. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God, and it affirms to me we can pray and be certain of God hearing our prayers anytime from any place. That folk is so encouraging. Our two-year-old granddaughter, Audrey, when she sees something she really likes, says, wow. I say wow at this verse. To be encouraged today, to be encouraged this week, no matter where you are, you can pray and the Lord will hear, will hear you. The Lord directs a great fish to swim by at the moment that Jonah is thrown overboard. The fish swallows Jonah, and he is in the belly three days and three nights. The Lord's timing in both Jonah's life and our life is perfect. Isn't that amazing? The great fish swims by at exactly at the right time. It affirms the Lord's timing. Well, what Jonah teaches us then further about divine direction? Well, first of all, it, it teaches me that adults need to seek divine direction. Seeking the Lord's will is not just a young adult thing. It's not just a teenage thing. It is a lifelong pursuit of the child of God. And that is an important lesson here. Jonah's an adult in this story, and he receives divine direction. But further, in adults seeking divine direction, Jonah is a lot like me and a lot like you in that he struggles with divine direction. That becomes an encouragement to me. It shows me that I'm not alone when I struggle. And if we're honest, we often struggle with the Lord's will. In chapter 1, he runs away from the Lord, and in chapter 4, he becomes angry with the Lord when the Lord's salvation has come to the Ninevites. They have responded, and the Lord has lifted the curtain of judgment from them, and Jonah becomes angry with the Lord at doing this. Verse 1 of the chapter says, But Jonah was greatly displeased, and, become, and became angry with the Lord. This was a very bumpy ride of divine direction, okay? And if your road of divine direction isn't totally smooth, go and look at the Jonah story. The Message Bible has a fascinating paraphrase introduction to the book of Jonah. And actually, th this introduction is, is, is significant to me because it, it makes me able to relate to this guy, Jonah. This is what Eugene Peterson says. Jonah is not a hero too high and mighty for us to identify with, and he doesn't do only things great. In fact, he doesn't do anything great. We find Jonah a companion in our ineptness. That word ineptness means feebleness or weakness, a companion in our weakness. Even when Jonah does it right, like preaching, he does it wrong by getting angry with God. Isn't that fascinating? Even when he does it right, he gets it wrong by becoming angry with the Lord that the Lord has actually saved these guys. We next see that the one directing is the God of the second chance. And I love that in my life, and I love that in yours as well. Picking up the quote from the Message Bible, goes on to say, but the whole time God is working within and around Jonah's very ineptness and accomplishing his purpose. The Lord is working in and around his feebleness and weakness. We, we see that it's hard to run away from God. The Lord shows the depths of his grace for this rebellious prophet by preparing a vicious storm and then by preparing a fish to swallow him at exactly the right time and to keep him alive for three days and then regurgitating him up on the land. It's a serious error to think that if we miss the Lord's will once, we have missed it for life. And that is one of the great devious tricks of the devil to tell us that we've missed God's will, and we might have. 
with a previous direction or decision, but we are finished as far as being directed by the Lord. The book of Jonah powerfully refutes this wrong thinking. The one directing our lives is the God of the second chance. And I encourage you with that this morning. Besides Jonah, we see the God of the second chance at work in many of the great heroes of Scripture. Not bit players, not people in the background, but great heroes of Scripture. Three of the most outstanding characters in Scripture experience the grace of the God of the second chance. One of them was King David. King David, I love the Psalms which he writes. I'm encouraged by reading the Psalms. I find the book of Psalms to be the easiest book in the Bible to apply, and maybe it's because of my limited intelligence, but I really like being able to apply the scriptures. But you look at this guy, David, and you see that he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Wrong. Never, never right. And the God of the second chance restores him. Second character that I see the God of the second chance involved in is Peter. Peter is the leader of the disciples, okay? He is the spokesperson for them. He is supposed to be the person of faith and power, okay? But what does he do on the night of Christ's arrest? He denies Jesus, even knowing him, three times, but the God of the second chance takes over, and after being filled with the Spirit, Peter becomes the preacher of Pentecost. Amazing example of the God of the second chance. Then finally we look at Paul. The Apostle Paul known previously as Saul is a violent persecutor of Christians, but the God of the second chance retrieves him, saves him, and turns him into the great Apostle Paul who is the writer of most of the New Testament. The God of the second chance. We recognize that in talking about the Lord's provision of this great fish, there is a wonderful expression in chapter 1, verse 17 that encourages me, and it says, but the Lord, but the Lord. Look at verse 17 with me here. At this time, the men greatly feared the Lord. They offered a sacrifice for the Lord, made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish uh, three days and three nights. Now the Lord, or but the Lord. I love those few words and how it shows in an amazing way that God is at work and the God of the second chance takes over. Acts chapter 3, Peter speaks to the amazed onlookers where there had just been the healing of this crippled beggar. And Peter talks about how the Jewish people have taken Jesus and have crucified him on the cross and tried to wipe him out. And Peter says, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. Those two words, but God. The words in the book of Jonah, but the Lord. We recognize the power of those words and the importance of them in our lives. Acts chapter 13, Paul is preaching about the crucifixion of Christ. And in verse 30 says, but God raised him from the dead. The two words, but God, but the Lord, become a tremendous injection of power into the, into the, into the themes of Scripture and into the themes of our lives. In all of these expressions, there's this common element that God's power and grace triumphs over everything. If we're willing to cooperate with the Lord in our lives, if we're willing to follow the divine direction, and that's a big if, okay, if we're willing to do this, the Lord's power and grace will triumph. But God is involved in all of our lives as we allow him to be that way. In the book of Jonah, God is the God of the second chance for these ruthless, bloodthirsty pagans, the Ninevites even. The Lord sends a preacher to tell them about him and judgment is spared. We recognize that as Gentiles, they are not part of the chosen people. They're not part of the Jewish race, but God's grace extends to all. God loves all of humanity. 
Well, perhaps you're here this morning, and I don't really know your story, but God does. And perhaps you feel that you've made some terrible decisions in the past in your life. I encourage you to be encouraged by Jonah, but God. This guy, Jonah, blew it. He blew it a number of times, but the Lord intervened in all of them. Be encouraged that we serve and know the God of the second chance. Next, as we look at this story, we see this truth. Don't avoid the hard things in life. Don't avoid the hard things. Jonah seems to be okay with obeying the Lord when the Lord tells him to do something that is easy and popular. Earlier in the scriptures, we read in 2 Kings 14 and 25 that the Lord directed Jonah to prophesy to King Jeroboam II. And the prophecy was a very positive prophecy. It was Jeroboam II, you will expand the territory in which you will rule. Wonderful, positive prophecy. This would have been easy and popular prophecy. And Jonah gives that. But, like us so often, Jonah stumbles when the Lord directs him to do something really hard and preach to these sinful Ninevites. In hard times, we're called on to trust his word in a very special way. Colossians 4 and 12 says this, stand firm in all the will of God. I love that. Stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. 1 Thessalonians 5 24 says, The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it, even when it's hard, and most certainly when it's hard, and especially when it's hard. Let me give you an example of a hard thing the Lord told me. I have referred to this before, but let me expand on it and give you some further background. As a 29-year-old single Bible college instructor in Edmonton, now known then as Northwest Bible College, I was asked by the International Missions Department of the PUC to go to Nairobi, Kenya, and help to start up Pan-Africa Christian College. And let me give you a little bit of background on Pan-Africa Christian College. Pan-Africa Christian College is located on a 10-acre piece of property on what was then the outskirts of Nairobi, one of the great cities in Africa, okay? A beautiful piece of property in a prime location in that great and influential city of Nairobi. The buildings were originally built by the Russians to be a school of political science. However, the Russians being the Russians and Mr. Putin being Mr. Putin, they taught the Kenyans revolution and how to overthrow the government. Well, the Kenyans weren't too happy when this school got in operation, so they shut it down. It lay vacant for a number of years, and the American evangelist, Morris Sorello, you might know his name, bought the property and wanted it to become a Bible college. However, Morris Sorello had no network of teachers and instructors. He was an evangelist. It wasn't his gifting. So he came to the Pentecostal Assemblies of Canada and said, would you like to buy this property? Magnificent property. Absolutely glorious. The POC miraculously negotiated, and my dad was the treasurer of the POC at that point, a very favorable price, and the property was purchased. Now the challenge is, who goes over there and helps start this fledgling college, this college which in fact is not in existence? And that's where the POC came into the picture and contacted Jim in Edmonton. Well, I lean very heavily on what I believe is the most consistent impression the Lord is giving me over a period of time. And that's something to hold on to. Because, you see, we get all kinds of impressions when we pray about the Lord's will, positive, negative, neutral, or whatever. But over a period of time, what is the most consistent impression I am getting? 
Well, I didn't want to leave Canada. I was already in ministry. I didn't have to go to Kenya in order to start ministry. I was already serving the Lord. I, but I felt that the most Im consistent impression I was getting was that I should go to Kenya. I remember getting off the plane in Nairobi, and it was a glor glorious, sunny Sunday morning in Nairobi at 8 a.m. the plane landed, and I thought to myself, what am I doing here? <laughs> I am 10,000 miles from home. I hardly know anybody here. I am single. I don't have any relatives. And you know, it turned out to be the two most challenging years of my life. It would be glorious if I said to you, I questioned the Lord and then he brought amazing blessing into my life. He did bring blessing, but it was the two most challenging years of my life. Well, why was it challenging? Well, here's, and you have to understand my personality. Uh, both the PSA missionaries in Kenya and the local Kenyan church didn't want PACC in the first place. And here I had come 10 thousand miles from Canada to help start this unwanted Bible college. Uh, my personality is such that, and Catherine knows this, I kind of like affirmation, don't I, Catherine? And she says amen to that. And here I was in this country 10,000 miles away from home working in a context where they didn't really even want me. Well, why wasn't I back in Canada enjoying my family and friends back there? I was single living in a country with few friends and no family. The missionary couple who I went to go with, they're great people, and they, and they invited me to come with them, and they were committed to be there two years, and I was committed to be there two years. Then, lo and behold, in the middle of their two-year term, they got a word that things were in trouble in their Bible college in Canada, and they told me, we're going back to Canada midway in the term, and I'm stuck here, folk, for the remaining year and being abandoned by these people who supposedly have invited me to come. Well, the Lord worked in an amazing way. I'm not here to say that I raised up Pan-Africa Christian College and saw the enrollment soar. It didn't. But I was a bridge in order to continue its existence. Today, Pan-Africa Christian University, as it now is known, is greatly appreciated by both missionaries and the local Kenyan church. It is a leadership university for students from all over Africa, the only university that the POC is connected with, and it has an enrollment of 600 students. I'm not applauding myself. I'm not patting myself on the back, but it was one example of doing the hard thing. Are you open to the challenge of missions? Are you open to the challenge of doing the hard thing here in terms of the Lord's will in your situation today? The conclusion we come to is, we live in a world that encourages us to choose the path of least resistance. That's what our world teaches us. Look out for number one and choose the path of least resistance. To borrow from the experience of Jonah, our world teaches us to avoid the Ninevehs of life. Stay away from the tough stuff like the Ninevehs. Our world says indulge yourself sexually and don't reserve sex just for marriage with your spouse. That's wrong, but our world says take the easy road out. Our world says don't worry about f being faithful to the Lord's house in worship. There are more people who are sleeping in this morning than who are in church this morning. That's what our world says to us. Our world says to us, don't worry about tithing. There's many other people that are richer than you who can give more than you at Delta Church. The world says to us, don't worry about getting up a few minutes early and reading the scripture and praying because, you know, you do need your sleep. Our world says to us, don't worry about witnessing to that person at your work. There's somebody else who will witness to them, and it's not up to you. Jonah tells us that the path of least resistance is not the path of the follower of God. Jonah tells us that following God is not just frothy sentimentality. It is not just nice, warm feelings. Following God sometimes involves 
making challenging decisions which are right. John Stott is one of my heroes as a Christian leader. You've probably heard of Dr. John Stott, one of the great evangelical leaders, an Anglican minister, All Souls Langham Place in London, England for many years, chaplain to the Queen, great evangelical scholar. My first encounter with John Stott was when I was a student at at uh, University of Toronto and our InterVarsity Christian Fellowship group went down to the Urbana Missionary Conference, 15,000 students. John Stott taught us all week. Later on, I was in seminary, took a course from John Stott in Sermon on the Mount at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. John Stott was a lifelong ba- bachelor and he just passed away about a couple of years ago, but his last piece of advice to his assistant before he died was simply this, just four words he said to his assistant. These four words were, do the hard thing. I like that. Do the hard thing. David Brooks, Stott's assistant, commented on these words. He said, Stott believed that choosing the easy trail, the road most taken, the path of least resistance, can only end up in mediocrity. Being mediocre in our Christian life is not the Lord's will for any of his followers, as Jonah learned the hard way. I encourage myself, I encourage you this morning, be concerned about doing the Lord's will no matter how young or how old you are. And when it's hard, even do it then. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit, Lord, who has strengthened and directed us this morning. Thank you, dear Lord, that we can learn from this guy, Jonah, Lord. He was very human. He was very much like us, Lord. And may we learn to do the hard thing. May we learn, first of all, to be concerned about your will, no matter how young or how old we are. May we, Lord, do what you instruct and depend upon your grace and depend upon your strength, even when the decision seems to be difficult. Father, may you be with us in a very real way as we seek your will, seek your face, and even do the hard thing. Bless those this morning, Lord, that are hearing your word. May we be honest enough to look inside our hearts and minds and ask, Lord, what are you telling me to do today? Lord, where are you telling me to go? me to go, bring me to go to the people around me, and help us to be true followers of Jesus, we pray in your name, amen. Would you please stand with me this morning? We're going to worship the Lord as we bring our worship experience to a close, but as you are praying... Perhaps the Lord is directing you to do a hard thing and you're finding it hard to respond to that. I believe there are those here who are hearing the Lord. Bill and Elaine and Catherine and I are coming to stand at the front here. And if you would like prayer to be able to do the hard thing in your situation, I invite you to come and just let us lay hands on you and pray. You don't have to tell us what it is. If you want to tell us, you can but you don't have to tell us. And so as we're singing, as we're worshiping, as we're committing our lives to the Lord, as the plane of truth is landing in our hearts and we're allowing the Spirit to apply the truth today to our situation, not just flying over us, but landing in our hearts, I I invite you to come and uh, we'd love to pray with you. You don't have to tell us what it is. If you want to, you can. But uh, let's worship the Lord as we bring our service to a close. Thank you, guys. Let's sing.